Hey folks, welcome back to Ken Michaels Radio, where here we talk about the Beatles with many people in the industry, like authors, podcasters, uh, musicians, artists, producers, you name it. And I have, as I always do, a special guest this time out, and it's David Wilde, who's had a long career in the entertainment industry, in both music and in television. Um, he's been a contributing writer for Rolling Stone magazine. He's also um, written a few books, which what we might want to talk about, a couple of books on the, the TV show Friends and one book on Seinfeld. And um, he uh, is also a writer for TV shows and specials. He's been involved with the Grammy Awards as a writer uh, since uh, 2001, I believe, and also as a producer since 2016. And he has a, a new podcast show that we're going to talk about a little bit later on. And most recently, he collaborated with Ringo Starr on this brand new book called Lifted, which essentially is a bunch of photos, some of which you've seen, some of which you may not have seen before, that uh, are either from Ringo's private collection or that he lifted off the internet. And there's some really wonderful photos in here and all of the proceeds of this book go to Ringo's charity called the Lotus Foundation. So with that very long, maybe over long introduction, let's welcome David Wilde to Ken Michaels Radio. Thank you. I, I think uh, I just realized how old I am listening to that introduction. I've, I've uh, a dinosaur, you know, I have, uh, you, you could carbon date me all the stuff I've done. <laughs> no, I my wife actually, thought... my wife did refuse to carbon date me. I asked her out many times, but she said no. I thought it said here you accomplished all this in five years. I actually did peak early. <laughs> the, 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 the horrible truth is I was the music editor of Rolling Stone at like it, a couple of years out of college. I, I was pretty much a hot shot. Then I think I've basically been coasting uh, no, what the truth is that I got my dream job very early at Rolling Stone. Uh, but since around 2000, uh, I was out here for the magazine and fell into TV, which ended up being a good thing because uh, journalism became a tougher world and television uh, is still out there. And uh, yeah, so really, yeah, since 2000, I've been pretty much most of the time a writer, producer, and TV. Uh, but then again, when things like during a global pandemic, you know, you do other things. Uh, I wrote a couple, two books with Ringo and that that's not bad. And, mm. uh, and booked Ringo to do the Grammys uh, a couple, like 2021. And uh, yeah, those are good things. I, I, I enjoy it all. Wow. Why don't we... Um just talk about the very beginning of um, your interest in music. Who were the artists that you grew up listening to? And who were your favorites? Where did the Beatles fit in? And how expansive now is your interest in different types of music? Well, I mean, music is the core of my thinking. It, my Twitter is at wild about music and that was the name of my middle school record column. Uh, my uh, college, I think, record column. Uh, I, uh, but interestingly with the Beatles, there's sort of a misconception, not that people have conceptions about me for the most part, but a lot of people have seen me on uh, that series, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, that uh, CNN series, which you can find on uh, Netflix, I think, and other places. But in the Beatles episode, I'm sort of, it's really me and Questlove and ha uh, Tom Hanks telling you about the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because as a result of all these people always say to me, where were you when you watched the Beatles on Ed Sullivan? I said, well, I am not quite old enough to have watched the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. I am old enough to have fallen in love with the Raspberries on like Don Kirshner uh, or Midnight Special and then realized hold on, maybe Eric Carmen didn't invent this form of music and go back and become a Beatles fanatic. And the it, it sort of, that's resonated in my life in many ways because I think the time, I probably got really interested in music around 1974, somewhere in the 70s is when I fell in love with music. So the records, like I have, I've had the 
chance to tell Paul McCartney that my Sergeant Pepper was banned on the run. Mm. That I, and years later, I was on the road with Paul and Linda on Linda's last tour and a tour that changed my life because if you want to get into the story, Linda ordered me to marry my now wife of 27 years back then. And she changed my life in a number of ways. She was so great. But on that tour, I remember very vividly after the, one of the gigs in uh, Argentina, I think we were on a bus and I'm in the back with Paul and he goes, any requests? And I was like, yeah, more band on the run. Cause that was around the era now, like where he started playing a lot of Beatles. Uh -huh. And I, I think the Beatles are quite good. The people on your YouTube channel probably agree, but I have to say, I have this sort of mid seventies Beatles solo album obsession because that's, you always love where you came in and really, so that music is incredibly special to me. It even resonated years later uh, when Paul played the Grammys for the first like time, really started becoming a Grammy regular. Mm. Uh, he said, I'm going to do, uh, we asked him to end the show like with sort of a jam number and just rock out. And he told us, okay, I'm going to do 1985. Maybe because he remembered I'm, an, I'm a band on the run fanatic. Yeah. And until about three days before the show, he called Ken Ehrlich and I'm with Ken. Uh, and we're at Staples Center, which is now crypto.com or whatever it is, uh, uh, arena. But I remember he, Paul said, I'm thinking maybe I should do uh, the Abbey Road medley instead. And we were like, yeah, that's OK, too. He goes, I'm thinking I should get like uh, a Grohl and, uh, you know, uh, was it Joe? Wall? I'm not even sure. But he goes, I think maybe can we get Bruce? And so Ken called John Landau and said, uh, would Bruce be willing to play the Abbey Road medley with Paul at the end of the Grammys? Uh, and John Landau once said, I'm going to call Bruce right now, uh -huh. called Ken back, and I'll never forget the call. Uh, I'm sitting there, on the, it's on speakerphone. He goes, okay, Bruce has just one question. When you say Paul McCartney, you mean the one from the Beatles, right? <laughs> and, we went, and Ken said, yeah, that one. He goes, okay, then Bruce would be happy to jam with that guy uh, at the end of the Grammy. So that was supposed to be 1985, uh, which would have been cool for me, but it became Abbey Road, which ended up being pretty cool for the rest of the world too. Hey, listen, 1985 is, along with one of Paul's ballads, Only Love Remains, uh, ranks as my favorite of his post Beatles songs. And um, I remember on a podcast show that I was a part of back around, I'm thinking 2010, we did a survey as to what songs we'd like to see Paul do live that he's never done live before. And we had to pick one Beatles song and one solo song. And I picked The Night Before in 1985. What a song. And I love both of those. Yeah, both. Great. Yeah. I went to the first show of that tour, which was at Yankee Stadium, and he did both those songs. So I was in heaven. <laughs> You know, no, it's amazing. I mean, one of the things that's amazing is that, A, we have two Beatles out on the road this summer, right. that after all we've been through, that these two guys still want to get out there and play for people. It's amazing and life affirming. But also that you can still have first with them. Like the fact that they can still pull out a song that you haven't heard them do mm. is amazing. The fact that Ringo, when we were doing this book, would tell me something and I was like, I never knew that. And now part of it, maybe I'm just getting old and I knew it and I forgot it and I know it again now. But mm. part of it is that it's just totally, uh, you know, I guess with Beatles history, I'm not telling you because you're more a part of that. And, you know, you're, you're an expert in a way I, I might not be. I'm an expert that in the sense that I, I think I have the love of an expert and I have had I've been blessed because of my weird life to, you know, weave in and out of some of their lives. Ringo, the most of all. I mean, Ringo, I met 32 years ago when he was, was 32, when he did the first all-star band tour and really have, we've never stopped talking on and off ever since. But other, like, even, the only one I never met was John and he died when I was in college. And I remember writing you know the obit and uh but even that years later i got to do we did after 9 11 uh we did a john lennon tribute in new york and i got to at least work through my lifelong love of john and even working with ringo on lifted like his love of john mm. 
comes through so loud and clear. I mean, obviously George and Paul as well, but like he wants, one of the nicest things he ever said to me was many years ago, we were talking about something with John. He goes, oh, David, you would have loved John and he might've liked you too, which I thought was like the nicest near compliment I've ever received. Like, you know, I, 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 I wish I could have met him. Uh, I think he is one of the most fascinating people in history. So yeah, a chance to, you know, I would never, when, when Lifted came up, Ringo said, uh, uh, you know how you always wanted me to do a Beatles book? And I think is I always wanted to do a Beatles book, I never would have the nerve to ask him to do anything. I mean, it's, he's, he's, he's Ringo, I, he can do what he wants. But I was happy to have, especially during the pandemic, I spent, you know, because I usually am running around doing a million TV shows. That's sort of what my life has become. Obviously, there was less running around in that time, but I did get to spend, you know, work on help him write two books during the pandemic, you know. So I've been around him in a mask because I want him safe and I want him to live forever. And but to sit and work with him, you know, and talk about the all star band and then talk about the Beatles, you know, that's pretty that was a, it really helped make my uh, my quarantine a lot more pleasant. What was the second book you worked on? Was it the All-Star Band book? The All-Star Band book. Okay. I'm so grateful that that's out because you've got, you know, 30 plus years of All-Stars and so many great stars, many of which are no longer with us, to have so many photos there and Ringo share his memories about it. It's a blessing. I, I, oh, no, I that, wonder why it took so long for him to do this. So I think because he... You know, he after years in which he didn't tour, he's been out on the road and do, out and about doing so many things that the pandemic did give him a time to like reflect on some of these things. For me, it was also with the All Star Band. I I think back based you know just what you're saying. I think back the fact that because of him, I got to meet so many people who were gone. I got to meet Dr. John. I got to meet you know, the band guys, I got to meet Billy Preston, like, that's just like the first tour. But over the years, like people who were still around, but who, I don't know if I would have gotten to meet Roger Hodgson without him. I don't know if I would have gotten to meet, I got to meet Ian Hunter backstage, you know, yeah. I uh, even uh, one tour hanging around with Eric Carmen, who through the raspberries was part of the reason I got into the Beatles, because I, I loved all this Beatlesque rock. And then I realized, huh, if it's Beatlesque, I should probably check out the Beatles and uh, and went back and and bought everything of the Beatles. Let me ask you a few questions here. First of all, have you been to every single All Star Band tour? Yes, I have gone to every one one show at least of every tour. Okay, very good. So have I. Do you have a favorite of all those? Because they're all so so amazing, all of them. Uh, the one with, I guess it was Ian Hunter, Roger Hodge, and I will just tell you the reason. If I'm, I think I remember correctly, this it's more because of the thing that happened that day, which was my wife and I had two young kids at that point. I think they were three and five or something like that, little boys. And Ringo said, bring your family to the show. Right before the show, we someone came up, a security guard, or maybe it was someone with Elizabeth Front, maybe, you know, I don't know who it was, I forget, but they brought us back and to meet Ringo right before the show. And my I had to prepare my kids for the show because they're three and five. I took them to Yellow Submarine the weekend before it was showing at some like theater in uh, LA. It uh -huh. scared the hell out of them because you can forget as an old guy like me, Yellow Submarine is kind of trippy. It's a little out there for really little kids. So after we got home, I showed them, I have a, you know, a disc of the Ruddles. I showed them the Ruddles to sort of show them what the Beatles were like. So when my three-year-old and five-year-old walked into the dressing room, Ringo looked at my younger son, Alec, and said, oh my God, you're so young, you don't even know who I am. I went, and my son said, Alec said, yeah, I know who you are. You used to be a Ruddle, right? And Ringo broke up laughing, goes, unfortunately, I wasn't that lucky, son. So <laughs> cut to like three years later, where we've run into each other at one of Ringo's birthday parties, uh, I walk into the, you know, the Capitol Studios party after with my son and Ringo grabs him by the hand. He's now at this point, he's probably like nine or 10, grabs him by the hand and rushes him over to Eric Idle and says, tell him what you said when you met me. And I went, 
if a beetle, when I was nine, had taken me by the hand to a guy from Monty Python, who I did grow up knowing and loving, right. my head would have exploded. You know, it's like, and to my son, I thought, my son has a weird life uh, with, you know, with that. But uh, yeah, so that's, but I've, I've enjoyed most every tour. There's things like, do you remember the year Dave Mason dropped or was put fired at right. some point? And there was, I think it was Frampton and Jack Bruce had a sort of just took up more guitar. I think it was that year. And Frampton was so good. Like, I thought that was a great year. Um, uh, I, but there's, I, I don't think I've ever not enjoyed a show. And also I've gotten to know Lukather very well uh, because he was in the house band. He and Peter were our house guitarists for Don was in the Grammy Salute to the Beatles that we did. And I, I worked on that. It's one of my favorite projects ever, but it was such, in addition to a million other things, getting to hang out and get to know Luke and Peter was just the blast because I've, you know, I've, it sort of made us uh, friends for life. And I was a fan of, I grew, I did grow up on Toto and Frampton just being a 70s kid. So uh, in fact, I always am bringing up, maybe you, I don't think I could stump you, but someone in your world must, I've always keep bringing up to Peter Frampton and Ringo, the book Paperback Writer, do you know Paperback Writer? Oh, yeah, I know of The it. Mark Shipper book, yeah. in which the, it creates a world where Peter Framp, they, the Beatles do reunite in the 70s and end up opening for Peter Frampton. It's sort of a comic novel. I always bring it up to them and they never quite have read it, but uh, I, I haven't read it in years, but I probably have to go back to it. Yeah. I got to tell you, it's been such a joy, you know, seeing Ringo with the All-Stars all these years, but my favorite tour is that very same one that you mentioned. I think part of it is because I love Roger Hodgson a lot. And I think that he's one of the most amazing singers for him to sing all those high notes on the logical song, for example. And I love one of the great joys for me in seeing Ringo is the diversity in the music. And when you've got Roger Hodgson and you've got Sheila E <laughs> and you've got Howard Jones and Ian Hunter in the same band, you know, the Court of the Crimson King and then the Glamorous Life, you know, in the same show. And Ringo's there for all of it. It's, it's it was so spectacular for me. But I, I I agree with you, and I will also say that it's funny with Roger because I got to know him fairly well after that. But I had realized part of the thing with him was I love Super Tramp. You know, growing up when I grew up, they were massive to me. Roger, in particular, all his songs are the ones that really emotionally connect with me. But he's not someone you ever saw. Like I don't know that he. You know, maybe he toured after he left Super Trip. I never saw him anywhere. So to get to actually hear him singing those songs and discovering he can still, even today, he can still sing those songs somehow. He's one of those guys who just is still great. So, uh, yes, we can do the spinoff hour on Roger Hodgson. Yeah. A few years ago, him. well, pre-pandemic, my family went to see him in concert. He sounded fantastic. Amazing. No, I, I, yeah, I went... Uh, he went and he was played the Orange County, whatever the venue was, like a shed with Al Stewart opening a couple of years ago, right before the pandemic. And uh, I was by myself. So I went to get during the, I went to get a beverage, like a soda during the show. And he started dedicating a song to me. That's almost never happened to me. So I literally was like, I, I ordered the drink and then ran in to hear what the hell he was going to dedicate to me. Then I went back out to get my drink. Oh, what song was it? It was a, uh, it was like one trip every trip one day. It was not. It was it was a solo song. It was not a super tramp song. And I don't want to get it wrong, so I won't say it. I won't, okay. I, yeah. I, since I you mentioned I the raspberries and all, uh, yes. while the Beatles were together in the '60s, did you follow any of that music? You, you must have heard it. The Beatles. Yeah. Uh, well, I was eight when they broke up. So my only memories are that a guy named David Klein, who was my neighbor, his brother had like the posters from the White Album in their basement mm. and would play Beatles records. But that's probably 69. I, so I'm seven, eight. I do remember hearing Beatles every time I went to their house. Right. We then ended up having a record column together uh, in middle school. So a little later than that, but I do, my parents had three Beatles albums, I think, uh, and I, I would, you know, I would listen to them, I love, I thought they were great, 
but I just didn't know anything until, uh, yeah, yeah, I think really my, it's all backwards from Ringo's, you know, the Ringo album uh-huh. from like Band on the Run. Uh, I think it re- that really is me. And, and, and I envy my kids, like in the streaming world, you just go back and can go back album for album. Mm. I used to have to go to record stores or the library or my school library yeah. and check them out and then check them out once I checked them out. So uh, I, I, I became a total Beatles fanatic, uh, but really I think in the seventies and sort of like, um, you know, but also it was at the same time, like I do remember for my college paper, uh, I wrote for the Cornell Daily Sun and I review, I re- remember reviewing Deface the Music, which uh-huh. I love, you know, the Todd Utopia tribute to the Beatles record. And I remember very vividly, I'm like, whatever the first Ringo tour was with Todd, uh, I went in for the rehearsals because I would always write like, I interviewed Ringo and on all, most of those tours for Rolling Stone or a lot of them. So uh-huh. I remember going to the rehearsals and Todd was there and I started going in front of, like Ringo was right here. And I said, Todd, have you told them about the face of music? And Todd was like, no. Like Todd was like not wanting to bring that up in case it was like, you know, misunderstood. So uh, yeah, in my head, yeah, Beatle, uh, they, they were an influence. I So I don't have that sort of like firsthand memory uh, but I feel like in a weird way that makes certain things. I did go in college to see, I, I, I don't know when it was sort of taken out of circulation, but there was like a midnight showing of Let It Be, the movie uh, at Cornell and watching it and being, bum- I remember being bummed out, like, mm. oh my God, they look so miserable. Like this wasn't as much fun because having, I did see in the seventies discovered you know, Hard Day's Night, which I think is one of the best movies ever made mm. and all that. But when you see Let It Be, at least I haven't gone back since then, but I remember going, oh, this is pretty depressing. And then when we were working on Lifted, Ringo had or seen an early cut of uh, Get Back. And he goes, David, you are going to love Get Back. And I, I said, I can't wait. He said, it's going to prove everything I ever told you was true. And really the core of what he meant was, he had always told me, he goes, David, when we fought, we fought like brothers, but we were always brothers, but there was always love. It's not like people want to depict. Mm-hmm. And that's when I watched Get Back, I, I cried 14 times because I just was so moved by the fact that having spent my life because of Rolling Stone, a lot of my life has been spent with groups of guys and bands and seeing how they talk to each other and treat each other. And if that's the worst it was during Get Back, you know, during Let It Be, mm-hmm. I still you still see so much respect and love, like uh, when George and stuff I'd never seen. Like that's I'm not the kind of Beatles fanatic who's seen everything, outtakes and bootlegs and that sort of thing. I will say I had the experience. I moved here in 1991. I'm in L.A. and Tom Petty uh, and his first wife Jane sort of adopted me. And Tom had just, I think, in the, around that time, 90, 89, I don't know, at some point, George Harrison had given him all this sort of unheard, unseen Beatles stuff because he was a Beatles fanatic. So I did have, I do remember spending like parts of 91 and 92 with Tom Petty playing me stuff and like just unheard, you know, uh, rehearsal stuff. And he would just always sit and he'd just play it for hours on end. And he'd say, David, they were always great. The minute that Ringo joined the band, they are the greatest thing in history. And he goes, even when they're bad, they are great. Like even in their, even in their worst moments, there's, he goes, a great band is a great, it's chemistry. And the Beatles are the ultimate chemistry kit of all time. It's like you, uh, it's, that's why it's like whenever anyone sort of says anything uh, like tries to disrespect Ringo in any way, I think like you're out of your mind because the Beatles are just simply not the Beatles until Ringo's in it. And I say this having entertained Pete Best in my, Pete Best when came, once came to Rolling Stone, <laughs> like mm-hmm. he was on like an American tour and he asked if I would come up and, you know, if he could have a meeting. And so he walked into my office 
And someone right before he got there said, it's his birthday today. Uh, and so I said to my assistant, go get him a cake. And bought, we bought him like a $8, whatever, Petridge Farm birthday cake. And we had birthday cake. And then Jan Wenner walked in and he goes, why are you buying Pete Best a birthday cake? And I'm like, because he got thrown out of the Beatles, Jan. <laughs> it's like, the least I can do is get him a freaking cake and a candle or two. Wow. So many things. I would love to have been a fly on the wall when Tom Petty's playing this stuff for you. And I'm wondering if it's the same stuff that's been bootlegged or if it's something that George had privately. You never know. I'm pretty sure whatever he gotten would have been from George. In fact, I think I asked Ringo that. I said, would you have given him stuff? He goes, no, not George. <laughs> that would have been George. Uh, I don't think I would have given him stuff. Uh, I did recently have an amazing moment when uh, when the book, when Lifted came out, someone, oh, someone asked me to go on a podcast and talk about a record that I loved. And uh, I said, I'd like to go talk about Time Takes Time. Uh, because when I moved here, I moved here in 91. And that was, uh, I, I hung around a lot while that record was being made, while they shot the video. And I went on YouTube the way you can now, and just started searching like, I said, I remember being at the video shoot. I wonder, like, what's the video? And I, you know, uh, and uh, for Way to the World, this was. Right. And I put on the video. And then it, the next thing it took me to was like some EPK. And I'm looking at the EPK. And there's a, then there's suddenly something called like Ringo Meets the Press. And there's Ringo talking to Tom Petty. And I go, huh, like I would have, I remember, this seems a little familiar. And then I look in the corner and there's some ugly guy in the corner. And I said, oh yeah, that's me. Like, so there's, and I have a vague, but it's like, I could do my own podcast on how the hell did that happen? I, I have this vague memory that maybe Tom said, I'm going to interview Ringo for something. You want to come with me? And I was like, yeah, you know, back me up if I run out of questions or something. But it's literally like, see yourself like I guess that's what happens if you live a long time I'm like how could I forget being at an interview with Tom and Ringo and I'm just sitting there like you know tanning I I, I can't explain it wow I'd love to do a whole show with you on time takes time because right now we're approaching its 30th anniversary and to me that album was like it's the start of his renaissance uh, well, I would be happy to, I just, I literally did a podcast because they asked me to pick, this is, they said, pick one album you'd love to talk about. And I said, that one, because I, well, A, because I wanted to talk about Lifted, but, but it does take me back. And I went back to the record. It's an amazing record because also it's produced by a group of great producers. And yet it's a very coherent group uh, album. And I got Don Was to call in and we had a long conversation about it. He has the same strong feelings that like, it was, you know, on a weird label from a guy who, from Tangerine Dream. But if you go back, that's one of the best albums he ever made. It's it's just amazing. And uh, I found out so much about it. Yeah, it's, it, I would love there to be some, and by the way, Ringo agrees. I asked him about it uh, a few months ago. Uh, I was with him for some other little thing. And I said, I'm going to go talk about Times Take Time. He goes, it's one of my best albums. <laughs> You know, uh, so he he agrees. Well, thank you for saying that because I've been saying it for many years, and it's ten tracks that are all solid. And like you said, there's four producers on the album, and I guess with the exception of maybe the Jeff Lynne tracks, I can't tell a Don Was song from a, a Phil Ramone, Phil Ramone Peter or Asher. Peter Asher. Yeah, yeah, and all the songs are really good, and. Um, yeah, on the private music label, and it should have done a lot better. Probably could didn't have enough promotion or money for promotion for it. You know. Yeah, it also probably because uh, Don and I talked about it. It definitely there probably was not enough support for it. Also, the timing of coming in the middle of grunge. It was not a grungy record. It was a beautifully produced uh, piece of work. It was, and it holds up just amazing. Yeah. And also the radio stations the top 40 stations that cater to a younger demographic are not going to play someone that old at this point. It's very difficult for aging artists to still get airplay on top 40 radio. Eventually they get phased out. So, But, but think how amazing it makes that, that Paul and Ringo both, they're going to keep writing and making music. They have not let that deter them. I think it's proof that, you know, when I met, 
Ringo. He was literally just coming out of clearing his head after a long uh, time where it wasn't so clear. And I think he learned his lesson, which was, you know, the drumming is my madness. A drum, he's, he's, he said, I think he says in lifted something like the worst times in my life are when I stopped following my natural path and stopped drumming and making music. So I think in a weird way, all the, I, I, it's so interesting with the Beatles. I'm sure you find this too. Like you mentioned all these books I did about Friends or Seinfeld. Mm. Every one of these great shows and every great movie, sometimes at, at one point or another, if you talk to people who've been through any success, they will compare it to the Beatles. And I will tell, tell you that I, because I did the Friends books, I know that people would say like, you're like the Beatles of sitcoms or whatever. And no one's like the Beatles ultimately, but there is that sense. And like even this for the podcast, this Naked Lunch podcast, this weekend, Phil Rosenthal and I, who are co-hosting it, we had lunch Saturday with the stars of Everything Everywhere All at Once, which is this new phenomenal movie, uh, you know, which, uh, but the stars of it, we were talking about the movie and it's this, it's like a superhero, you know, an Asian superhero uh, groundbreaking cinema experience that's turning into a phenomena, but the message of the movie ends up being like love. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I, I said like, maybe it's just because I'm seeing this so soon after seeing Get Back, but like, you realize like the biggest success stories and like my co-host is Phil Rosenthal who did Everybody Loves Raymond. Sure. And the same sort of thing you come down to, like there are only so many messages you can get across. And the power of peace and love, which Ringo says constantly, it ends up being the best. Uh, it's not only the best thing to do uh, morally and ethically, it also, in terms of storytelling, it's the greatest story ever told, like the power, redemptive power of love. And uh, I, it's amazing how, like, I don't know, I'm sure this is your experience, but like, I've been in so many groups of people working through their feelings about get back over the last, you know, this, this year. And I, I don't know many people who haven't found it to be an emotional, a major emotional moment in their life. Like mm -hmm. to be able, the healing power of seeing like, A, they're genius. So you see Paul McCartney, that get back, that moment of creation is just like unbelievable. Uh, but also like the little things like, when George comes over to help Ringo a little bit with Octopus's Garden, mm -hmm. I just go like, that's what we need to do for one another. Like, you know, you can see the love that George had for Ringo. Like, I know I've, I met George uh, in the most amazingly interesting way at Tom Petty's house uh, on Christmas. I don't know if it was 92. I suspect it mm -hmm. would have been 91 or two, but uh, and that's a whole other story, but I had my moment with him was there and, uh, uh, and he was, uh, he was everything I could in, because I was supposed to interview him for Rolling Stone at one point, and mm -hmm. then he got ill and it sort of didn't happen, but I'm so happy in retrospect that I had my day, my Christmas day around George, and he was everything you wanted him to be like, he, he couldn't have been cooler no way it could have been any cooler. Anything you remember that you talked about with him? Well, the funniest moment was, uh, there's two moments. One, a little embarrassing, but I'll say it, is I walked in and I was single guy and just moved to LA. And mm -hmm. first thing was, there were only like 40 people, 30, 40 people at the party. And I noticed a pretty woman because I noticed pretty women. And I was like, oh, there's a pretty woman. And then a guy came up and hugged her from behind. And I went, oh, that pretty woman must be George Harrison's wife because that guy hugging her is George Harrison. And so I was like, okay. And that took me aback because I'd never met George. Then my other favorite moment was sitting down on the couch for the gift exchange. And I had got, been, I had Tom in the gift exchange knowing how much, because he played me all the Beatles music. Uh -huh. I went to a, get a, a Beatles, uh, it was a Life magazine, original Life magazine and had it framed. Uh, of the Beatles. Uh -huh. So when he opened up the gift, I was sitting next to George on the couch and George looked at me and goes, oh yeah, the fabs, I remember them. <laughs> I, I thought, I felt like I was living in Hard Day's Night. It was so cool.
cool and great. And uh, yeah, there's other stories. Uh, uh, I ended up working, uh, helping for a day on during the making of the George documentary, working, helping Scorsese for a day uh, uh, at George's house. That was something. Um, uh, there's so many stories, but yeah, I, uh, I did not meet John. He's the only one I never met because he died when I was in school. But uh, right after 9-11, um, uh, we did the John Lennon tribute at Radio City Music Hall. It was the first show in New York after. Uh, and so that was like, at least I got my chance to sort of show my love and respect. And I've tried to do it in all sorts of ways, you know, uh, in a lot of different work. Because I, uh, yeah, I wish I'd met him. And I, I like to think Ringo is right, that there's a chance he might have liked me too. I don't, I don't know. Did you get to meet Sean since he performed at that show? And, yes, in uh, fact, I got, yes. Had you gotten to know Yoko at all? Uh, I worked with Yoko on that, but I didn't get to know her well. I've written for her on the Grammys, you know, uh, but I, I didn't get to know her well. I've, I got to know Olivia a little better. Uh, Linda changed my life. So that's, uh, Sean, I met at that event. Uh, I will, I'll confide in you that at that num that show went long because, um basically because the audience wouldn't stop cheering. Uh, the show, if you go back and find it, was hosted by Kevin Spacey, right. who then, that was before he was canceled by about 20 years. So, uh, but I do remember, like I wrote a monologue for him and because it was the first show live in front of a live audience in New York after 9-11, yeah. the audience wouldn't stop giving standing ovation. So we were over, the three minute open went 12 minutes and we were over the whole show and the executive producer, Ken Ehrlich, who I did the Grammys with for many years said, we have to cut some numbers. We don't, you know, we've, we're over. So tell Sean to cut in one of his songs. And I went, no, you tell Sean, I'm not cutting a song by at his father's tribute. And we didn't cut the song, uh, thank God. Uh, um, but I met Sean briefly then. Uh, I met Julian a few times, um, but, uh, yeah, the most significant, besides Ringo and Barbara, who've been great to me, the one, the person that really changed my life was Linda, because uh, when I met her uh, for Rolling Stone, writing about, you know, uh, uh, around the time they, I think they just put out Hope of Deliverance had just come out as a single, and they went on the whole, that whole tour, um, and I went around the world with them, and some, I don't know why she must have took a liking to me because backstage in South America, she took a picture of me and said, I'm going to send this, uh, I took a picture of you. I want, you can use it for your books as your author's photo. So I have my portrait taken by the great, you know, Linda McCartney, which was nice. That would have been plenty nice. But then around the time we came back through the States, she said, David, I want to ask you a question. I said, what's that? She goes, do you have a girlfriend? And I had just met a girl like, right before the trip, we gone on like three dates. Hmm. And uh, she goes, I wanna meet her. And I was like, well, she's in New York because we were coming back. They were playing, I think, Giant Stadium the next day. Uh -huh. She goes, I wanna meet her. So bring her to a uh, sound check tomorrow and we'll have lunch. And so that was my fourth date with my wife was, and my wife, unfortunately, didn't give it damn about music like she's not she now is a music person after 27 years of marriage to me and uh -huh. but at the time she owned one album on cassette and nothing to play it on that was you know so our love was not really about music at first but in any case huh. linda said bring her to the show and even my wife then knew that was a fun thing to do to go see paul mccartney do a sound check and when we had lunch at the end of lunch, Linda pulled me over aside and she goes, and she said these sentences, which I are like some of the most seared into my mind sentences anyone's ever said to me. She goes, do you think I know, David, do you think I know about love and marriage? And I was like, well, I grew up around a pretty terrible marriage from my parents and you two seem to have a great marriage. So yeah, I think you seem to know a lot about love and marriage. Uh -huh. And she said, then take this from me take this advice from me, marry that girl right away. And I, it was such an unusual thing. Like you sometimes have 
your parents pressuring you or maybe her parents pressuring you, but you don't usually have Linda McCartney pressure. <laughs> and so it really made an impression. We did end up getting engaged like pretty quickly that year. Uh -huh. And that she was, Linda was the first person to make me think, oh, maybe this isn't just some girl I want to go out with. Maybe this is my wife. And 27 years, you know, this summer, uh, we'll be celebrating July 31st, our 28th year together. And I owe it to Linda. The crazy version of that story is that uh, if you look at my phone, which I'll, I, I can call up this for you. But so after, after that, you know, uh, Linda got ill. Uh, after that, I hosted a show on Bravo called Musicians. And Mary McCartney was our staff photographer. So I was around that period when Linda was gone and all sorts of stuff happened. And then um, cut to my, my, we have kids. And the year that Paul comes back to the Grammys, our, my kids are now like maybe 15 and 13 or, so, or something like that. Mm. Uh, and my wife is coming backstage with them for like, I think the first time to go to the Grammys and to come meet me backstage. And my wife walks in, she goes, you won't believe what just happened. And I said, what's that? She goes, I'm walking down the hall and Paul McCartney says, stop, I need a picture with those boys. And, and even in the world of the backstage of the Grammys, let me tell you, Paul McCartney is not usually the one asking for photos. He's usually, even other stars want a photo with him because he's right. Paul McCartney. So my wife comes and shows me this picture, which is my two sons with Paul. And she, and I can't figure out how, why this has happened because my wife, it's been at this point, 18 years or whatever. I don't think Paul could have recognized her and what could it be? So I, I had two theories. Either it was the spirit of Linda telling him to do that, or the Jonas Brothers, I believe, were on the show that year. And maybe he thought they were the Jonas Brothers. I, you know, they're, I'm from Jersey. They're from Jersey. It could be. Uh, and then cut to year, four years ago, we did the 60th anniversary Grammy special. I went to Chicago where he was playing whatever the big shed outside of Chicago is. Mm. And we asked for, uh, I was supposed to interview him for about the 60th anniversary of the Grammys. And he's a busy guy. He said, I'll give you 15 minutes on the side of the stage before I go on. So I think we used 14 minutes of that. And then I'm standing on the side of the stage and he's about to go on. And I said, Paul, since we have a minute, can I ask you a question? I said, I have two theories about this photo. We're, you know, and I asked him and he started to tear up and he goes, David, don't make me cry before I go on stage, which I always took to mean it was in his head too, that was must have been Linda's spirit saying, you're responsible for these kids. So uh, take the photo. So that's why this has been on my phone ever since. It will never leave. That's my, that's my phone picture. What an amazing story right there. And I'll bet it was Linda. You know, I, 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 you know what? And it's so funny. Like, I think I've been in a couple of those a and &E, the women of the Beatles, the wives of the Beatles. And uh -huh. we sort of get into it in a quarter or two and lift it. But like, the insanity of people blaming women, you know, people being so hateful towards the women they love. It's like, it's, it's, it's such a juvenile thing. And, you know, all I can say is like, I, one of the million times I teared up watching Get Back was watching Linda in, uh, in Get Back, because it just was so amazing to see them so young and in love. And like, you know, her daughter responding to, you know, it was just so beautiful. And she was such a beautiful person. Uh, I, I only knew her for that period of my life and she was gone, but she did, she changed my life in a major way. Yeah, well, you know, there have been so many discussions about the Beatle breakup and what caused it and everybody can have their own theories. And I just happen to believe that those four loved each other, each other so much. There had to have been a lot of reasons why they broke up. But, um, you know, depending on who you ask, you can zero in on any particular angle that you want, but there's no way that you won't be able to not convince me that the four of them loved each other with all their hearts. And we I, do I say, yeah, I, I know it. I mean, I, 
I've experienced it enough. I've been around them enough to know that's true. I, I and by the way, it's like, I, I think let it be was terrible misinformation. It was like, uh, I think in the editing, they clearly, you know, the Beatles had broken up. So they made a movie about the Beatles not really like getting along. And that's not what the film showed. You know, I think uh, it's amazing that when we heard about Get Back, I thought it might be like an attempt to rewrite history, but I really think it ended up correcting the record. You know, I think that's what's happened. Well, the more that you see of them footage wise, the more accurate a picture you're going to get. Yep. So that's just the way that I look at it. Yeah. Uh, Get Back was the greatest gift we've been given as, as Beatle fans, as far as, as a group, probably since the Beatles anthology, as, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Do you think you've, you've come to know Paul pretty well? Um, I mean, I've had, you know, I, uh, I spent the time with him as a journalist then, uh, but since then, it's mainly been doing, you know, big TV shows and being around him. And I mean, there's moments I can't believe I, I lived the, I mean, for one, uh, when he did a number uh, uh, with Jay-Z, if you remember when he appeared on stage with Jay-Z, do you remember this? Um, you mean Kanye? No, no, before Kanye, he appeared with uh, Jay-Z and... Um, in any case, I he did he, the first time, I think this might've been the first time he actually came to the Grammys that year. He wore, uh, uh, Con, I'm sorry, Jay-Z, you said Kanye, so I'm gonna keep it. Jay-Z wore a John Lennon shirt and they were on stage and they had done uh, a version uh, of the song Numb with the group. I can't believe I'm spacing the name of the group. Give me a second. Um, uh, but, at the during rehearsals, Paul walked over to me and said, "David, you have any thoughts about what I should say, like during at the end of the number or anything like that?" And I said, um, "Why don't you say I hope we pass the Grammy audition?" <laughs> and, uh, and what's funny is oh, that Lincoln Park. It was uh, Jay Z, Lincoln Park, and Paul. Okay. Uh, uh, and uh, but he actually asked me for to pitch him a line on what to say, and he said, "Like I hope we pass the Grammy audition," which is a phrase that was relatively obscure all, almost then, but then became much uh, less. Uh, another moment I can't, like, uh, another moment I will never forget was at the Grammys Beatles tribute, which you can't find, I think, anymore. I don't think it's on YouTube or anything like that, but uh, we did that. That was our first Grammy tribute show that we did, and we did it the day after the Grammy, so we would have all the artists still around. Mm -hmm. But as a result, I, only Ken Earl and I, I think worked on both shows. So we went right from the Grammys. The next morning, we're about to tape this other show. And I had written the show and it had been, I'd run this script. I think Apple had seen it to make sure that there was nothing wrong. The one fact that they said, you should check with Paul <laughs> was when we had John Legend and Alicia Keys doing, doing a version of Let It Be that was beautiful, hmm. beautiful. But I wrote an intro for them Alicia and John went back and forth and sort of talked about the song, but it said some version of, you know, as the Beatles were beginning to unravel, John, I'm sorry, as the Beatles were beginning to unravel, Paul thought about his mother and sought, you know, a comforting, a, a moment of comfort in the middle of all the cultural, everything mm -hmm. going on in the Beatles and in the culture, something like that. And they said, that sounds exactly right. But it goes, we don't know if that's true. <laughs> like mm. that's, I don't think he's ever said that yet. And uh, so I should have probably pulled them aside after the Grammys that night and said, is this right? But I, I, in all the craziness of the Grammys, which are an exhausting, crazy show, I didn't. I caught a couple hours sleep and we're about, we're taping the show and Ringo and Paul are sitting there watching. I don't know if you remember, but they sort of were like supporting everyone and clapping for everyone. They couldn't have been like the Beatles, more loving and great about it. But when John and Alicia started to speak, I was like, I turned to Ken, I said, oh my God, if he waves his head, no, <laughs> I'm gonna be, I'm in big trouble because I've just you know, screwed it all up. And when John and Alicia started reading it, 
we had a camera because the way your TV, you always have like six cameras and one is dedicated on Paul and Ringo. Yeah. And when they started saying the intro, Paul nodded yes, like sweetly. And I was like, okay, good. I'm going to live to write another day. That was a great special. I enjoyed that a lot. You know, Thanks. Um, especially I didn't sing at all. Dave Grohl oh. um, doing Hey Bulldog, was it? I yes, think. that was his choice. Yeah. That was a lot. Uh, I'll tell you, a real regret of mine is um, Tom Petty was, he, we, the, it was Jeff Lynn, I think it was Danny uh, Grohl, um, and I wanted Petty to do it. And I sort of begged him. And I think he was not into Grammys and TV and, uh, and didn't do it. And I wish I'd had that day with him because I know how much he loved George. I know how much he loved the Beatles. Uh, I would love to have that one more day I would have spent with Tom doing that song. But it was amazing. And in fact, I went back and looked at some performances on YouTube recently for the first time, because that's many years ago. And uh, there was also Joe Walsh and Gary Clark Jr. doing While My Guitar Gently Weeps, uh -huh. which was wild. And John Mayer and Keith Urban doing, was it Don't Bring Me Down? Uh, that was just so good. On a rooftop. We had, you know, it's sort of like, I'm glad the rooftop is coming back. I've, I'm now like anytime I'm doing a TV show, I'm like, let's go to a rooftop. As opposed to in the movie, it's like, let's take them to uh, the Middle East and make them play a, 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 you know, a, a, a hospital for kids or whatever the other bad ideas in let you know in Get Back where you. Right. Uh, by the way, what did you think of him, that our director friend? In that, in, when you go back and see him, what what did you think of the director? Peter Jackson. No, 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 no. The uh, Michael. Oh well, I think for its time, it was fine. I think that he had a lot of time constraints. You know. I, there was a lot of stuff that was taken out. I remember hearing word that um, three of the Beatles, everyone but John, felt that there was too much Yoko that had to be taken out of the original film. So, you know, I hate to say this because I, I feel very privileged. On one of the podcast shows that I, that I do, Things We Said Today, Peter Jackson gave us a, a near four-hour interview I listened to that. I did listen to that. That was great. That was really yeah. great. And he actually benefited, I hate to say it, from COVID. He was actually able to just keep building and building and making it longer and longer. And the more stuff you get to see, the more accurate a picture, the more that you learn about the whole thing. I mean, Get Back has been a revelation for me for so many reasons. You get to see the dynamic of all four of them. You get to see how their relationships change. You know, for me personally, um, the most fascinating aspect of watching Get Back is that in the very beginning when they're at Twickenham, they have this enormous pressure of putting together an album, doing a TV special and a concert, and can they pull it all off in a month? And Paul is really feeling the pressure. And you can see that in the way that he acts to the others. And he wants more, he wants the other musicians in the group to finish off the songs and work harder at it. And he's not feeling it. It's moving very slowly. And once things, once they have their meetings with George after he quits, things change once they go to Apple Studios. And it certainly seems to me like John was taking charge and Paul was more relieved about that. And the atmosphere really changed at that moment. So I think, um, no, they didn't have enough material for a full album yet. Um, but still what they accomplished in that short period of time was quite a lot. And, uh, you know, seeing the frustration in George in the very beginning, how I kind of felt like he was being ignored, you know, it's another thing that I only, cause I'm watching this another time now. And sometimes when you watch <laughs> several times over, you pick up things that you didn't see before, but it seems like every time that Paul's in a room with George and Ringo and John's not there. Paul pays attention to George. When John's in the room, Paul pays attention to John. Listen, yeah, little that's things. That's a very like yeah. I'll I tell you, that's a very that's an interesting insight. But I and I also have to tell you one thing I've learned. 
I've spent as much as anyone spent, I think I've spent most of the last 40 years around bands and around mostly because most bands have been all male, watching how groups of men work. And one thing I've realized is you always have to go back to the roots of, because it's like, I think a lot of other friendships or families, it's like the dynamics sometimes are frozen in time. And like, you can't, I went uh, before the pandemic, I finally, this is where I'm not a Beatles expert. I went for the first time to Liverpool mm -hmm. because my son was overseas studying and he goes, dad, I want a, you and mom to come meet me in London and show me London. He goes, I'm going to see every other city, but I want to wait and see London with you. I was yeah. like, absolutely. I, I, I was a student in London, love London. Great. And then the day or two before he called me and said, dad, I want to take a day and I want you to show me Liverpool. And I went, I've never been to Liverpool. And the truth is, I think that's partly because it's not like I ever had Ringo over the last 30 years saying, you got to go to Liverpool. Right. And, but, but when my son said, I want to go to Liverpool, my, my wife was like, You're, we're going to go to Liverpool. So I called and through like connections, I was, you know, I got set up for a very nice day in Liverpool where I was sort of, you know, uh, I will say it's the only place I've ever been where I was told your money is no good in this town. Like I, when I went to the cavern, they were like to my family, they're like, what would you like? And I was like, how much is that to go? No, no, whatever you want, you just have like uh -huh. whatever. And so I was like, so I, I should move there and live there. Cause that's not true anywhere else I've ever been. Uh, but I loved Liverpool, but I was very aware when I walked around Liverpool. Oh yeah. Like whatever the, and this is something Ringo said to me, like, you have, we think John Lennon working class hero. Then you go to the house where he grew up mm -hmm. versus where Ringo grew up. Right. And you realize to Ringo, Paul is, even though, and he's dealing with, you know, his losing his mom and, you know, and his father being away, but with his aunt, he grew up in a very nice part of town, you know, in a, in a lovely house. And we can always think the Beatles were always the Beatles, but the truth is everyone you meet was always a kid. And those childhood dynamics of like, who was the richer kid, who was the poorer kid, who like, you can actually feel the Beatles when you go to Liverpool. I was for the first time, I understood certain things about the dynamic of like, Paul was sort of a very middle class, nice place, but a little further out in the burbs kind of vibe. You know, Ringo had a really tough childhood. He was like in a hospital, a lot of it. And thank God, you know, uh, a nurse gave him some a drum to bang on and changed his life. That was a good thing. But like, I found that in groups from Van Halen, who were their childhood dynamics of like, who lived in the bigger house, who, you know, that sort of stuff never goes away. That stuff is, it's in, it's in the dynamic that is forged forever. And that's, uh, it's, it was amazing to realize that's even true in the Beatles. And I will tell you, I'm sorry, one more thing. I'm taking too much of your time. But on the, on the Beatles tribute, I had to write, had to, I was felt, felt lucky to get to write a little short, almost like story of each Beatle until they became a Beatle. There were little short packages and I had to write them well because everyone had to approve them. All four Beatles had to approve them. And only in doing that did the sort of like emotional truth of John and Paul, like why did these two guys form the greatest partnership in history. Like it is to me far and away the greatest creative partnership. I mean, anything, any in theater and movies, there's nothing better than mm. what those two did. And that's, you know, and that's why George is probably in a horrible position when we see him and get back because he's becoming maybe the third best writer in the world. And it's hard for him to get his due because he happens to be with one and two until that point. Yeah. Uh, um, but, you know, all of this, uh, I, I forget even what I'm rambling about now, but all of this was, oh, but doing those little short films, I realized how much of it was, here are two different dynamic guys, different experiences, but both losing a mother in different ways, so young, I think in a weird way that has to be part of the, the it created the hole that they filled with the greatest songs in history. Like their, their sensitivity, the way, I, again, I've seen nothing but bands who hate each other, who try to 
you know, messed each other up in different ways, who were nothing but competitive and nasty and hate. I've seen a lot of groups where it is metastasized to hate. They really hate each other. And in the Beatles, I don't think that ever happened. And I think part of that is that they were two souls who had dealt with loss at a young age and that their, their hearts were filled with a longing that comes out in the greatest songs ever written. And, and that partnership, it's kind of amazing that there are two guys who filled a void with something so magnificent. That's very perceptive. And I know other people have expressed that too. You know, there's this one moment in Get Back right before George quits where John and Paul are opposite each other, standing up, playing guitars, looking right at each other. And, you know, when I watch that, it's almost like those two are in love. <laughs> I, and it's I breathtaking to watch this. Yeah, you know? yeah I, I'm so, when I see George and, and Ringo working on Octopus's Garden, that's what I see. I see two people who love each other. And it was stunning. I mean, one of the things that was stunning to me was I've been around Ringo for 30 years and he's such a great talker. Mm. I realized part of it was he was also such a great listener. With the Beatles, half of what he's doing is feeling the energy in the room and being the greatest drummer in history. Like, uh, and that's, you to be a drummer, you have to serve the song. So you have to feel the songs happening. So that's what's like, the intuitive nature of what's going on. Because it's not like, I forget who asked me this recently. Some young person said like, who's the best band? Well, I'll tell you one more story about, what, you have time for one more story. Sure. <laughs> when I was going over to sort of be around the Scorsese doc for a day, my son was at, he was, you know, my same son who asked if Ringo or told Ringo he was a ruddle said, dad, why? is George Harrison your favorite guitar player? I said, yeah, he's my favorite guitar player. He goes, why? And I said, because unlike, he goes, I grew up in a time when a lot of guitar players were like about themselves and their ego and they were sort of showing off. I said, but there's no guitar player in history who is more about serving the song and less about serving himself. It's sort of like, it's not about the ego, it's about the music and the message. And he goes, oh, so George Harrison is the best guitarist because he's the best person who plays guitar. And I was like, whoa. So when, when I walked into the room with Martin Scorsese and Olivia and Danny that day, Martin Scorsese asked me something very, very much. It was like amazing because hey, he's my favorite filmmaker. I'd never met him before. He goes, what's your take on George? And I quoted my son and Fortunately, people agreed that that was my, my son had sort of answered the question better than I was ever going to answer. The yeah. Question. You know, I've said that about all four Beatles. It's always been about the song first, not about them. A hundred percent. The song is what matters. Are you a New York person originally? Originally, yes. I live in Connecticut now, but most of my life I lived in, uh, well, first Brooklyn, then Long Island. Because what Rico told me in Lifted, something like when we came to New York, he goes, that's part of the reason we got over was he goes, I, he said the press was out to kill us. They were going to kill us. He goes, but we had our liver putty and wit, liver putty and wit. And uh -huh. we, they had their New York way of talking. And he goes, it totally, they, we, we, they fell for each other because they had the same sort of like wise ass sort of sense of humor. Uh -huh. And I think that's, there's a lot of truth to that. Like uh, with the Monty Python thing with the Ruddles, it's like half the reason the Beatles, like, when you go back and try to say, how did this become so big? Because it's so big, it's not like there's anything that could ever challenge it. And part of it is, is that it was a revolution of wit, a revolution, you know, sort of like irony, uh, but also it's like you combine love and wit and the best songs of all time. Who's ever going to beat that? No, there's, there's no one. It can't happen. Nothing is, there can be none better. And maybe that's why they had to break up so that they wouldn't, you know, so they could keep something as perfect as it was. You know, it's like, if you drag something out, like I love the stones, uh -huh. <laughs> but in a, it's like two paths. One is to keep it going. And I guess one is to keep the magic and then be able to rediscover the magic in a million different ways. Like I, the, yeah, the Beatles broke up, but I don't know if I've had to, I don't think I've discussed anything 
with my circle of friends more than Get Back for the last year. I don't think, I don't think, and no movie, no TV show, no, uh, you know, it, it just was the biggest deal. It was like a, a love bomb going off. Well, it warrants it. It deserves it. Yeah. But you know, let me ask you this question. I think you've already kind of answered it, but is it best to leave while you're on top? Um, you trying to get me to leave right now? <laughs> um, uh, uh, okay, I'm sorry. Um, I don't know. I'm not that smart. I and I I don't second guess the Beatles. Uh, I don't. I think they did exactly what they should have done. I personally like. I think a lot of people who were around for the Beatles and remember that always view the solo records as something secondary. Like I don't like all things must pass. It's like it's still one of my favorite things ever done. Time, whether it's Ringo's the album, Ringo album or Time Takes Time, favorite albums of all time. Mm -hmm. Band on the Run, same thing. And some of Paul's recent records. Uh, um, so I have no problem. I'm not going to second guess the Beatles. I'm just going to listen and love it and uh, feel lifted by it. Literally, like, it's so funny is when Ringo said he wanted to do a book and call it Lifted, Right. He really meant it's about lifting the photos from seeing them. And yeah. like, I, I just kept on going, well, it's also, you lifted the world. <laughs> you know, I guess, oh yeah, yeah, that too. <laughs> so it's sort of, to me, it has, it, it, I think it grew to have a double meaning for both of us. Yeah. It's funny when, when I said um, leaving while you're on top, you know, there are some people who think always best to, to leave the people wanting more. And in a way, I mean, you wrote a book on two books on Friends. You wrote a book on Seinfeld. Those are two of the top sitcoms of all time. And at the very end, they were still the biggest shows, you know? Yes. So, and, uh, you know, and, and my podcast with Phil Rosenthal, he very much, believe me, I was around working with CBS a lot. They wanted more and more Everybody Loves Raymond. But right. he, he wanted to end it while it was at it, on top. And that's why my podcast will be debuting uh, Thursday and you can enjoy that. And hopefully, uh, yeah, uh, hopefully that will lift people eventually. Okay. Let me just ask two quick questions about lifted. Were there, were the photos all chosen by Ringo or did you help him with that? Um, he chose the photos and then certain photos we couldn't get rights to. And we replaced them with other photos that we got from Apple or like there were like I'll give you for instance like I think there was a little Richard photo that we couldn't use mm. and I was like we need to have little Richard in because you know I wanted to give Ringo a chance to comment on influences the Beatles and things like that so in some cases like we would go back and Apple would help us find a good image uh, but that's it's basically it's fundamentally what Ringo found on his on his phone and computer and mm. that was how the book was really done was he on his computer him pushing click we went through his photos that he loved and he told me the stories and that's as much fun as i could have during a pandemic sitting so he remembered a lot of uh when these photos were taken yeah, and yes happened. and uh, other things i would go back and look but uh yes he, this is but again this is not as he says in the intro he's not a beatles uh, he's not a beatles expert he's just a beetle no i'm not a beetle historian i'm just a beetle with some history so yeah. it's not trying to outdo all the historians who study it. He just, it's about what he felt about this stuff. Well, there were some photos I wanted to ask you about, but you know, we, we ran a little bit too long, maybe for yourself, but this one right here, which I've seen before, do you know anything about this, this particular one? I'm pretty sure um, it was the front cover of Bootleg, <laughs> but when uh, was this taken? The I, of the Beatles and candles next to it? I don't, I, I don't remember. And I, in, in many instances, we literally just, if he took a photo and we didn't know, we just did what it conjured up, why he liked it. Not trying to like, tell the story because there's stuff he can't remember and there's stuff, but again, it was not, we weren't trying to, uh, it's, it, it's less of a, uh, it really is like an emotional story of the Beatles. Mm. So this, this just images that mean something to him. I would think that certain photos triggered some memories that he hadn't thought about before. 
Well, certain things, and, and it triggered discussions. Like one of the things that, uh, like Jimmy Kimmel, I don't know if you saw Ringo on Jimmy Kimmel. Did you mm -hmm. watch that interview? Yeah. But like when he went through the book and they talked about certain photos, like one of the amazing things was like, there's things that you've heard before, but like when you really hear like the idea of them in a hotel room and you realize they shared, you know, they got the two little suites and, you know, and them in the car together. Like yeah. the fact, because I've been on the road with bands like Fleetwood Mac, where everyone's in a different limo, everyone's in a different hotel, every, like, you know, they only meet on stage at certain points in their career kind of thing. The Beatles were not that. The Beatles were, you know, you know, originally like, yeah, four guys in a car and a road manager driving them. Like that's what they were. And then they got to the hotel and they maybe, you know, shared a little, you know, a room in a, a living room, you know, that's who the Beatles were. And uh, I think that's part of the story. And it's part of like the brotherhood, you know? And that's the thing that Ringo told me the first time I met him, he said, David, there's only like other three other guys who understand it. It's like, in a weird way, it's like a language the rest of the, the only three of them speak. Mm. Only four of them will ever speak. Yeah. All right, finally, tell us more what, what you, would like to tell us about the new podcast. Where can it be found? Um, how long is each episode? Um, is it a one-hour show, or does it? It's it's the show is called Naked Lunch. If you go to your podcast app, just search Naked Lunch. Any it's it's from Stitcher. Mm -hmm. We made a deal with Stitcher, Sirius, which owns Stitcher. That, that's who, sort of who we're we're love we're very lucky to be working with them. But you can get it on Apple on you know, whatever podcast app you do, just put Naked Lunch in. It's the great thing about a podcast, it's as long as you want it to be. So it's, uh, but I think that they're trying, uh, we're trying to keep them edited to around an hour. Uh, there's a couple that will test that and we may have to make a couple two-part episodes. But for instance, on Thursday, we're starting out with a, a double serving of Naked Lunch. So you'll be able to hear, because uh, sort of the root of the show is, for 20 years now, 25 years, Phil Rosenthal, who people love from Somebody Feed Phil, but also created Everybody Loves Raymond. Mm. Uh, we've been like close friends and we've had lunch once a week, at least, even during the pandemic for 20 years, because we just have so much fun. And over the years, I'll bring a musician or he'll bring a comedian or, or and our individual friends have become all friends. So. The actual opening, the first two episodes you'll hear on Thursday, actually by accident reveal that. There's Brad Paisley, who's a country star, who is a very good friend of mine, who I've worked with for 20 years and written a book with. And, and about three years ago, I took him to lunch with Phil and now they're super close friends. We're, so that's one episode. And Brad wrote our theme song, which is, I love, it's my 30, I like the Beatles, but the 38 seconds of Theme from Naked Lunch by Brad Paisley. That's that's the most important song ever recorded. Uh, and then the second, well, the, then the other episode you'll hear is Ray Romano and Brad Garrett from Everybody Loves Raymond, who are obviously, that's how I met Phil was, I was the TV critic for Rolling Stone. I went to review the new season of TV. I reviewed every show and basically said, sucks, 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 sucks. And then, and there's one great new show and it's Everybody Loves Raymond. So then after that ran, he called me over and I had lunch with Ray and, and, and Phil probably for the first time. Uh -huh. And then we did the tribute, uh, like we ran into each other and I wrote a piece or two about them. But then uh, I was asked to be the head writer for the Tribute to Heroes, the telethon after 9-11. Yeah. And I called Phil, I said, come help me. And we worked together on that. And we've been, so ever since that's when we've been friends. So that's 20 years, but we've been, constantly launching and now it's a show and i really think people I, I would ask everyone to check it out and how often will there be new shows every week uh there'll be uh i think we are contracted currently to do like 42 this year uh -huh. we have done like 12 already uh uh we've had lunch with everyone from uh uh Jimmy Jam to Paul Reiser to Allison Janney to uh, I'm having we're having lunch with Cheryl Crow 
Uh, Friday, we had lunch with um, the stars of Everything Everywhere All at Once, uh, chefs, comedians, uh, uh, actors, uh, and who knows, maybe eventually Beatles, who knows? Well, so uh, it's basically, it, yeah, it could be anyone. And it's literally just uh, laughing and having lunch. That's all it is. Well, I can't wait to check it out. And I would advise all of our viewers to do the same. Please do. And uh, David, this has been wonderful sharing your memories. Come back anytime. <laughs> Thank you. We could do I, a whole I, show on Time Takes Time. <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh, believe me, I'm going to go listen to it right now. Yeah. Well, like I said, 30th anniversary now. Coming yep. right up. So, well, we got to get Ringo to uh, some company. We need to get a record. Maybe uh, Ringo's company will put it out under uh, like a uh, re. I, I know Don was would work with me on it. Let's do a let's do it for charity for his charity. Let's do a special edition. Okay, I'm totally for that. <laughs> it could be called "Time Takes Even More Time." You got all the right ideas, David. <laughs> all right, thank you. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks to My all pleasure. of you for watching, and we'll see you next time.